In this video, we're going to add another kind of autonomy to our robot, and that's object tracking using the camera. Also known as visual servoing, this is where we use the camera to detect a key object, and then based on where that object is within the field of view, we send the appropriate control signals to the motors so that the robot can follow it. So this algorithm is going to have two different nodes. The first one is going to handle all the image processing. So it's going to take the camera feed, use OpenCV to detect an object, and return the coordinates of that object within the camera frame. Then the second node is going to subscribe to that measurement and use it to calculate the appropriate command velocity to send to the control system. I'll be using a tennis ball as the object to track for this particular tutorial, but you could extend this concept to track a face or another robot or anything else that you can detect. As always, the video is going to have two parts. First of all, we're going to get everything up and going in simulation in Gazebo first, and then we're going to get it going on the actual robot. Before we really get stuck into things, there's a couple of little things we're going to do. First up, I'm going to install OpenCV for Python, if you haven't already, because uh, the code we're going to use later on depends on that. So I'll just type sudo apt install python3 opencv. And it'll help if you can spell Python correctly. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to update our twistmux.yaml. So you might remember from before we had uh, one for navigation and one for the joystick. We're introducing a new source of command velocity now that's going to be the object tracking. So I'm just going to take the navigation one and copy and paste that. So we'll rename this to uh, tracker and we'll change the topic to command vel tracker and I'll set the priority somewhere similar to navigation just so that they don't fight each other. All right, so we can now fire up our simulation just like normal. So we'll just do that. Once Gazebo is up and running, we want to start by adding our simulated tennis ball. So I'll click the Add Sphere icon and put it there. Now that doesn't look very much like a tennis ball at the moment, so let's select it, right click and go Edit Model. We want to select the link again, right click and go Open Link Inspector. Then in here, in the Visual Settings, we want to go down, change the Material Script from grey to yellow and then change the radius to 0.033 to make it a regulation tennis ball. Now, the other thing we've got to make sure we do is change the collision. So that's really the more important one. So we want to change the collision geometry to also be 0.033. Press OK. Now we can save it, and we'll just let it save to the default location, but we'll rename it to tennis ball. And then we can exit the model editor. Are you sure? Yes. And now you can see it's kind of hovering midair. That's because Gazebo is paused right now. So if we press play, it should fall to the ground. And if for some reason we need to add more of them, so you quit Gazebo and come back later, you can just go to this Insert tab up here, click Tennis Ball, and start adding more tennis balls into your scene. Now, the other thing we may want to do is adjust our camera position. Our real camera may be pointing slightly up or slightly down. So I'm going to quickly go here into our camera.exacro and up at our camera joint here, I'm going to adjust the rotation. So I'm going to put uh, 0.18 radians of rotation on mine. You may or may not want to do this. Um, and now I'm going to restart Gazebo. All right, so now we can start up Arviz. And we should see, just like normal, our robot's there, and we've got our camera image coming through. So this is using the camera tab rather than the image tab, and that means we see the 3D things on, overlaid on top of the image. Now that we've got our camera seeing the ball, the first node we need is one that's going to detect it. So we want this node to take the raw image in, pick out the ball, and return its location within the frame. We're going to have the center of the frame be 0, 0, and the frame edges be 1. Remember that the optical frame has X to the right and Y down. So a ball that's three quarters across and two thirds down from the top left corner is going to have a position of 0 0.5, 0 0.33. We'll also return the diameter of the detected ball as the Z value of this point, And that will be as a fraction of the frame width. So a ball that was half as wide as the whole frame is going to have a Z value of 0 0.5. This code is heavily based on a ROS1 tutorial by Tiziano Fioranzani, and so if you want more detail on this, I encourage you to go ahead and check that out. 
So to run this node, what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and clone my repo. So we're going to get into our source directory and git clone. In my case, I'm cloning it using SSH, but you should be using HTTP. And then I'm going to get back up to the root and build it with Colcon. So now that it's built, we can run the detection node. So I'll open a new tab, source our workspace. And the node we want to run is ROS2 run ball tracker detect ball. There's a few parameters and arguments to, that we have to set. So I'm going to set the tuning mode to true. And what this is going to do is while we're just testing and tuning things, it's going to pop up with a window of sliders that we can change to adjust the tuning. In the future, we'll just be sending those values in through a params file. We also want to remap the image topic that is by default image in to our image topic, which is camera slash image raw. All right, so that's popped up with this window. And what we can do now, we'll show our camera again, and we can add an image display. And I'm going to change this topic to image tuning. And so this is the tuning image that is being put out of this thing. And we can use this as part of our testing. So let's have a look at these parameters. We want to place the ball in front of the robot and then adjust these until the ball is seen as clearly as possible. Something else I'm going to do just temporarily, I'm going to open up this gazebo models section. I'm going to find the spectrum plane and I'm going to insert one of them into my scene. The reason I'm doing this, we'll just get that rotated correctly. This will just be a little bit helpful uh, in understanding as we adjust the image parameters. So back here in Arvis, we can see uh, our image stuff. Uh, it's not very clear, is it? Let's just move that across and we'll put our ball somewhere in front of it. So the first few things here we've got are X min and X max and Y min and Y max. That lets us change the frame in which it's looking for the ball. Often, say in this case, our ball's always going to be on the ground and we can see where the horizon is. So I'm going to chop off the top in Y so that if we've got uh, maybe objects that are up on a shelf or people walking around, it doesn't accidentally detect them. The next thing is the hue. And this is going to be the main thing that we use as a separator. So hue is a measure of kind of different colors. Now, for what it's worth, if you want to try and detect red, uh, that's very difficult for technical reasons. Um, so you can kind of get into the code and fiddle around with that and make it work if you want to. But in my case, I want to detect yellow. So I'm going to be adjusting these values to be somewhere around here. Oop, that's a bit far. And then we've got saturation, which is kind of a measure of how uh, bright and vibrant a color is. So if the saturation was all the way down here, then we'd only be detecting things in black and white. Um, but we want to probably leave that uh, somewhere around here. So we'll get rid of stuff that's like totally kind of black and white. As long as it's got a bit of color, it'll be kept. The last thing is value. So that's brightness and darkness. Um, and I'm just going to, that's not the value sliders, is the value sliders, brightness and darkness. We'll leave them alone. Uh, we can chop a little bit off the top. That'll get rid of things that are super bright, but our ball will often be brighter than this. Um, and then finally, this is the size. So we can knock out balls that are too big. And this is in percent of the screen space. So uh, if let's drop that to say 20% at the moment. So as long as the ball is less than 20% of the entire screen space, we want to detect it. And that's good. Sometimes you'll have things like a, a, a light or a, a person might get detected falsely as the ball. Um, and it'll be a really big circle and it thinks that that uh, is a big ball. So we'll leave that for now. When we're kind of happy with that, we can change this from image tuning to image out. And that'll show us our original image, but with the detected ball overlaid on top of it. And what we can also do, we can see the detection there, but we can type ROS2 topic echo slash detected ball. And we should get those point measurements. So we can see in this case, X is 0.6. So we're kind of two thirds of the way between the middle and the right hand side. Y is almost zero, so we're just uh, near the horizon. And then finally, Z is 0 0.055. So we're saying the width of this is about 5.5% of the total width of the frame. So that sounds pretty good to me. We can try uh, moving the ball to different locations, get rid of our spectrum plane, and check that we still see it. Here it's a bit confused because there's two balls, so it's just picking one of them. In this case, it's picked this one. 
and now would be a good time to write down these tuning parameters. Uh, for now, we'll just leave the window up, but later on in the tutorial, we're gonna take these parameters and put them all into a file so that we don't have to use the sliders each time. Now there are plenty of more advanced things we could be doing in terms of detection, but I just want to take a minute to look at one example. You see, as humans we know that the further away an object is, the smaller it looks. Given that, if we know the true size of the object and some characteristics about our camera, we should be able to estimate the location of that object in 3D space, just roughly. Now, if we were wanting to do this seriously, we could uh, go ahead and calibrate our camera and compensate for distortion, but since this is just a beginner kind of approach, this node just uses some simple trigonometry to figure out the location of the ball. To run the node, we're going to go ahead and open up a new tab, source our workspace, and type ROS2 run ball tracker detect ball 3D. So this runs on top of our other node. Now I've got some parameters uh, running there already by default. You can see it's doing stuff. So this is publishing another point topic, but this time instead of being the point within the image frame with the Z value being the size, this is trying to publish the 3D location of the ball in space. We can check that by going into RViz and we can add a marker topic. So it also publishes a marker topic and we'll set this to slash ball 3D marker. And we should see our ball here in 3D. Now, if we enable our camera view here, what this shows us is the image frame with the estimated 3D location of the ball overlaid on top. So you can see here, it's, it's a bit rough, but it's, it's not too bad. So let's uh, get rid of that ball so that we've only got one ball in our scene and take this one and let's move it to somewhere else. Is that still within the frame? No, we've gone a bit far out. So you can see here, it's pretty close. We move it over here. I would drive the robot around, but I forgot to bring the controller out here. So you can see it's a bit rough, but it should keep the ball in roughly the right spot in space. If we put the ball kind of halfway between the camera and the round part of this, so let's go for somewhere like that. We should be able to see that in our laser data. So halfway between the camera and the round part of that. Now we need to tell the robot to follow the ball. And so the follow ball node is going to use a pretty simple control scheme. If it can't see the ball, it's just going to spin the robot around in circles until it can see it. Once it sees it, it's going to look at how far the ball is away from the center of the frame and drive at a speed proportional to that in the angular speed. So if it's all the way on the left, then it's gonna try and steer to the left to see it. If the ball's all the way on the right, it's gonna try and steer to the right to catch it. Then finally, it's gonna look at the size of the ball. If the ball is too small, it's gonna think, oh, it's far away, and it's gonna drive just at a fixed speed forward until the ball is big enough or close enough that it sees it, it's near it, and it stops. If we don't have that limit in there, then it'll just keep going and going and going until it runs over the top of the ball, and we don't want that. So we'll open up a new tab, source our thing again. And we'll type ROS2 run ball tracker follow ball. Now again, there's a few parameters we can set here, but the main one we want to do is to remap the output topic. So ROS args dash R, we want to remap uh, command vel to that one that we set before in twistmux. So that was command vel tracker. We can see already the robot's having a go at it. So it should go up and find our ball. I'm just gonna move the ball on it. So it goes up, oh, I can't find the ball. I better start looking for it. Let's move it further away. See if it finds it. Sure enough, it's found the ball. So it's gonna go and chase it. And you can see the ball is staying in roughly the same spot in 3D space. So that means our, our other 3D node is working. And when it gets close to it, when it finds that it's big enough, it'll stop. So there it is. Now up to this point, we've been running a bunch of different nodes with parameters and remapping. And so just like with the other parts of our project, we can kind of combine all this together into launch files and params files. So to start off with, to help us, the ball tracker package comes with a launch file. So I'm going to close this one, close this one, come back to our main one here. 
And then instead of running the ball tracker like this, we can use ROS to launch ball tracker. And then if we look at the launch files, we can see here there's ball tracker.launch.py. And I'm going to go show args. So this will tell us all the arguments we can supply to this uh, launch file. So the params file. So we're going to make a params file. I'm going to put all the parameters that we need for that uh, in there for all the nodes. We've got detect only, so that'll only run the detection component. Follow only to only run the follow component. Tune detection, if we want to temporarily put tuning mode on to adjust the parameters. Uh, sim time for sim mode, we don't really need that because follow mode's not using it properly at the moment, but uh, in the future it will. Uh, the image topic that we want to use, so in this case it was camera image raw. The command vel topic and whether we want to enable that little 3D mode. So we're going to be using this launch file in just a minute. Um, but the other thing we want is params. So I'm going to scroll down and find the ball tracker that we cloned and it comes with an example config file. So I'm going to copy that and paste it into our own config directory. And then these parameters here, I'm going to, whoop, we want to make sure we get our one. I'm going to take the parameters that I wrote down earlier and replace them for these ones. And the parameters for the other nodes, I'm just going to leave the same. So now I should be able to run that launch file and I'm going to go params file and I pass in source slash articubot1 config ball. Oh, and I'm actually going to rename this file. So instead of ball tracker params example, I'm going to call it ball tracker params sim. So we're going to have two different params files, one for sim mode and one for the real robot. Uh, because sometimes we'll need slightly different parameters uh, because of the difference between the simulated camera and the real camera. So we'll go back to that terminal and we're going to change that now to sim.yaml and hopefully it should go ahead and it's running both of those nodes now. If we also wanted to add that 3D tracker, we go enable 3D tracker, set that to true. And so now we should be back running in that same mode as before. Uh, it's missed the ball to start with, but if we, whoop, I'm not doing a very good job of chasing it around. There we go, it's found it. So it's running exactly the same as before with a launch file. Now, even this launch is kind of a little bit tricky to run. There's a few different things there. Um, so there's nothing stopping us from actually making our own launch file that calls this launch file um, with the parameters that we want to use. So down in the ball tracker launch directory, you see there's another one here called example launch include. So I'm going to copy that file, put that into articubot1, rename that to uh, ball tracker. It's the same name as the other one, but they're different files. Um, set this to uh, articubot1. And you can take a look at this file if you want to. All it's doing is it's including the tracker launch file I forgot to do that remap when I ran the launch file before. Uh, the reason it worked is because it was publishing to CommandVel, which is the same thing that Nav2 is publishing on. And so it was using this part of the twist mux instead of this one that it should have been using. Um, but you can see we do the remaps um, and it will also automatically pick between the sim uh, YAML file and one we're about to create with the robot.yaml based on whether we set this to sim mode or not. So when I'm running that, I'd be able to run ROS2 Launch articubot1 ball tracker.launch.py, and then all I'd need to go is sim mode equals true or false. So now that we've got everything working in simulation, it's time to get it going on the real robot. Now we can either run the image detection nodes on the dev machine, so sending the camera feed to the dev machine to be processed, and then sending the control signals back, or we can run it all on board the robot. What I'm going to do is I'm going to tune it with the nodes running on the dev machine. Then once we've got our tuning parameters all sorted out, we can transfer it to the robot and run it all locally. So here I've already got our standard controller running and I've got the joystick node running on the dev machine so that I can drive it around. The first thing we're going to do before we run our camera node, I'm actually going to change some of the settings for it. So I'm going to open up uh, our camera launch. And you might see there's a couple of changes I've made here. 
Firstly, compared to when I first wrote this um, back in the camera video, I've since added uh, the time per frame parameter, so that controls the frame rate of the camera and stops it sending too much data. Um, the other thing, and this is the important one, we've added the camera namespace here. So before Gazebo was publishing uh, the image topic inside the camera namespace, whereas the camera node was just pu publishing it to slash image underscore raw. So this will put things in the camera namespace and match the way the Gazebo uh, does it. So with that change made, we can uh, run our camera launch file normally. The next problem we're going to run into is sending the image data across the Wi-Fi network to the dev machine to be processed. You see, raw image data is quite uh, a lot of data and it'll bog down the Wi-Fi network. So what we want to do is send a compressed image. Now that's fine for this end. Our camera node is already publishing a compressed image. But the problem is the Python nodes that are running the detection, they don't play so nicely with compressed images. So instead what we're going to do, just while we're running these on the dev machine, is we're going to run a republish node. So we saw that in an earlier video. What it's going to do, it's going to subscribe to the compressed image stream. So we've got compressed data going from the robot to the dev machine. And then it's going to republish that compressed image as an uncompressed image so that it can be processed locally on the dev machine. Once we're doing it all on the robot, we won't need to worry about any of this stuff. Uh, but while we are doing that, we'll have to make sure we remap all that topics accordingly. So I'm going to open this tab. And then what I'm running here is ROS2 run image transport republished. So we're going to go from compressed to raw. Our compressed topic is camera image raw compressed. So that's what this is publishing. And we're spitting out camera image raw uncompressed. So that should be running now. And we can check that that's working by running RQT image view. And so RQT image view can see the compressed stream, but we can also swap to our new uncompressed stream. And hopefully it should also be fairly low latency. So just like before, we're going to run it in tuning mode first. So I'll type, uh, we've got to source our workspace, then ROS2 launch ball tracker, ball tracker launch. Uh, now we want tune detection to be true. We want detect only at the moment. We don't want this to start running off the edge of the table while we're still tuning things. We want to change the image topic to Camera, image raw, uncompressed. So now if we run image view again, oops, let's wait for the tuning window to pop up. We should be able to swap to our image tuning. Okay, so we should see our window coming up there now. We can start looking at uh, tuning for our tennis ball. So let's turn this to face the wall. So I'll put the ball in front of it. We'll adjust our parameters just like we did on the simulation. All right, that seems pretty good. Now let's write down those parameters just like we did before. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to take our ball tracker sims params file. I'm going to duplicate it and I'm going to rename this one to underscore robot. All right, so now if we close uh, this down, we can close that and now close this one. So now uh, we'll pass in our new params file. We're no longer in tuning mode and no longer detecting only. So we'll do the whole thing. So now the robot is going to start turning until it can find the ball. And what it should do, once it sees the ball, it should try and follow it around. So if we open up RQT image view, we should put it on the right, make it steer to the right. If we put it on the left, it should chase around to the left. 
Oop, you can see there, there's a few other things of a similar color in the background it's getting a bit distracted by. We really need a bigger space to do this in, which we'll do in just a minute. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna uh, push those parameters up to the robot, and then we're gonna run all of this on the robot itself. Okay, so now I've pushed those parameters up to Git, pulled them back down onto the robot, and now I'm running all the code, including our custom launch file, on the robot via SSH. There are no launch arguments because the defaults are what we want for running on the robot. I'm also using the display trick from the last episode to show the output image on the robot screen. It's hard to tell in this shot, but you can just see the red outline of the detected ball. And again, I'm just checking that everything appears to be working fine with the robot off the ground before I let it go on its own. Now, free to roam, we can see a few shots of the robot searching for the ball, finding it, and then homing in on it. This hasn't been tuned super carefully, so sometimes it has a bit of trouble or it overshoots on the follow, but in general, it works. I can move the ball to various places around the room and the robot will follow it. This is obviously a very basic image tracking system and there are many different ways that we can improve it. A couple of ideas are you could improve the kind of things we're detecting. So you might want to detect faces or animals or something else. You might want to use neural networks or some other kind of system to do these detections. Uh, you could use a depth camera. So a depth camera, as well as just returning the location of the object within the image frame, it'll give us a depth to the image, which we can use for more advanced control mechanisms. You could offload some of the image computation onto a different processor. This might look like a GPU for very high compute scenarios but there are some cameras that actually have the ability to do image processing on board. So cameras like the Oak D Lite, they can offload some of that image processing onto the camera, which gives you more room for compute on the Pi itself. So now our robot can be driven remotely, it can scan a room and autonomously navigate it, and it can autonomously follow an object that it's scanned with the camera. And that means we're actually getting pretty close to the end of this series and the end of this project for now, but hopefully it'll serve as the basis for more projects in the future. In the next video, I'm going to tidy up a bunch of things, both in code and in hardware, and then after that, I'll be upgrading the whole system to the latest version of ROS, which is Humble. There are plenty of more things that we could upgrade or improve about this system, and I might do some of them then, or I might save them for a future series. Thanks very much to the patrons over at Patreon for making this channel possible. And for everyone, if you found this helpful or useful or interesting, please consider liking or subscribing. And if you've got any questions or comments about the things I've said, you'll find a link to the corresponding discussion topic over at the Articulated Robotics Forum in the description. Alright, I'll catch you next time.